Okay, please welcome Agnieszka with your applause. Good morning. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, that's not the full title of my talk, uh, but you may wonder why I use the phrase Soviet propaganda in the title of a talk that is given in 21st century. Well, I have to say I used to work in a university and sadly this is very relevant today. Uh, and uh, this work is basically the product of some of my traumas that I've been to through personally when I emigrated from Poland to Western academia and witnessed what was happening there. So my plan is that first I will give you the nature of all-encompassing all propaganda or information war that is meant to subvert society, uh, giving, giving the example of Soviet propaganda, which is the most extreme one to study. And then giving this example here, I will answer three questions. Firstly, uh, can the definition of aggression be expanded in the framework of natural law, given what we know, uh, given what we know of how societies are subverted? Second question is to see if and how Karl Popper might have been naive in phrasing his paradox of tolerance in 1945. And the third question is, what would be the best defense against ideological subversion? So the basis of the first question here is the natural law, and I'm sure everybody knows the concept that laws are not man-made, and individuals have inalienable rights to life, to property, and to stamp on these rights is effectively being a criminal in, in front of God, in front of truth, in front of nature. So I have... Uh, here I have put some of the favorite quotes of Judge Andrew Napolitano. He always quotes, uh, a man for all season, some men say the earth is flat, some men say the earth is round, but if it's flat, could parliament make it round? So the inalienable rights of individuals are of that same nature. They are not changeable by humans. And now we will work in this legal framework that if we restrict anybody's right to expression or life or property, then we are criminals. Um, so that's the basis of the first question. The second question also comes in a way from there. Uh, the paradox of tolerance. Uh, why paradox? Uh, so it has been phrased in uh, open society and its enemies. When Popper claimed that uh, he, the, the issue he's seen in free speech is that those who are intolerant might in the long run dis destroy the principle of tolerance. So if we uh, grant free speech to everybody, we also grant it to those that would seek to abolish it, uh, which could turn out to be self-destructive. So he would then say that there is no free speech for you if you say, don't want free speech. That's why, where the word paradox comes from. Now, there are two issues in this approach, or maybe even three. Well, the first one is that, well, who is to decide who we don't tolerate? And is, is, isn't that person a human being? And wouldn't that already violate the natural law? Uh, but the second uh, issue with this, and uh, I will explain it further in the talk, is that uh, for, such, uh, for this to work, there must be a clear demarcation line between those who are tolerant and those who are seeking to abolish free speech. And uh, if we want to carry out what Popper advocates, we would want to be able to clearly distinguish, aha, uh -huh, you are a propagandist. I will show that this is not possible, but I don't think that in 1945 he would see what's coming. So the question is, what happens if aggression is not yet aggression? Let's see that I want to install communism in the USA. I am an agent of Andropov. And uh, what I do is that I don't do it right away. I don't do violent revolution that would be a clear violation of the natural law. What I do first is uh, fund certain newspapers, uh, engage in a kind of cultural war, all those uh, activities that are not aggression in themselves. And uh, basically this is a phenomenon that was already written about before Christ in five, 
100 BC, Sun Tzu was sort of the first theorist of information war and of military strategy. And what he wrote is that, well, it's not, you're not really a skillful warrior if you win 100 victories energetically using your swords or tanks. You are really a skilled warrior if you fool your enemy to destroy themselves. So what he advocated for is to weaken the enemy's culture and make them think the opposite of what they should, and only then they would be the, the opposing army would be ready for energetic at attack. Or you could just wait until your enemy destroys themselves by listening to your propaganda. So if that's how they fight wars, can we extend the definition of aggression and still remain in the framework of natural law? What are we supposed to do now? Um, the rules of revolution uh, that are uh, written by the KGB propaganda department and given to us by some defectors are very similar to what Sun Tzu wrote uh, more than 2,000 years ago. So the principle of subversion is formulated in this way in his works. Um, cover with ridicule all of the valid traditions in the country, disrupt the work of the government, create conflict between different groups inside the society of, that, that you want to subvert to your rule, turn the young against the old, sp spread disunity and dispute this sort of measures. They are also a part of war. And uh, it is still always very relevant, and uh, the last century proved it very well. So this is actually a list of departments of uh, Soviet military uh, intelligence agency, and I should have put like a circle here. I think here is information war. Yes. So, however, when it comes to culture and politics, it was the KGB, not the GRU, that was doing the dirty work. Uh, so let's look at the example of century of exaggerations that will tell us the to show us the phenomenon better. Of course, these uh, defectors are difficult to cite. They, they are obviously traumatized and uh, very pessimistic, and they write certain pamphlets. One of the most known ones is The Love Letter to America, written by Yuri Bezmenov or Thomas Schumann. It can be found online, and in that pamphlet you could see how the rules of revolution for the KGB propaganda department are similar to what Sun Tzu advocated. And uh, this is Yuri Bezmenov. Uh, he actually was, due, was inside the workings of, of propaganda department, then he defected to Canada. Another example, maybe more prominent defector, the highest ranking uh, defector from the Eastern Bloc, uh, General Pacepa of Romania, uh, who, uh, who ran away to the US when Ceausescu ordered him to kill one of the leaders of uh, the radio, of the Free Europe radio. Uh, in his book, Disinformation, he lays down the process very, uh, in, in, very in, 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 in great detail. Uh, so he writes about the, the psychological manipulation. He writes about how uh, KGB was using theater plays and all kinds of arts and licentia poetica to create a discord between Jews and Catholic to undermine Pius XII, who was a saint man. Uh, they, 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 one of their uh, influence agents has written a play where he accused Pius XII of not being resistant enough to Nazi Germany, which couldn't be further away from the truth, and it was only done because uh, the Catholic Church was a great enemy uh, of Moscow. But it was just a play. So what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to shut down theaters in this way if we are fighting this information war? Well, then we would end up creating a dictatorship ourselves, and that is the problem here. So what are the stages of subversion? First, it's demoralization, destabilization, crisis, and only then normalization, which is direct political aggression. This is taken from Besmianov. And now the question is, is the defense here ethical or not? Because, and is defense here, is it too late? If we look at the rules for revolution, they are very similar to what Sun Tzu wrote. 
corrupt the young and make them superficial, divide the people into hostile groups by constantly harping on controversial issues of no importance, destroy people's faith in their national leaders uh, by contempt, ridicule, disgrace, always preach democracy but seize power as fast as ruthlessly as possible, uh, encourage inflation, uh, discontentment, turn one group against another group. Now, the United States have always been the biggest target of the propaganda department, and I suppose that you could see some of what's happening now in the list of these rules. Uh, so, what could be the answer to that, knowing that this uh, phenomenon exists and like we are fighting the information war? Uh, they came early, already in 1990, there was the example of the Lusk Committee, and uh, that was uh, basically uh, a measure that went against free speech in a scare against Bolshevism in the New York State. So that's another quote from Judge Napolitano. Uh, Senator Walters, whose resolution created the committee, was confident that it would serve its purpose, declaring, I trust that we shall not stop at anything in our effort to tear Bolshevism up with the roots. It's a very righteous effort, however, as we shall shortly see, it didn't matter to the state of New York that getting rid of Bolshevism meant hurling free speech into the sea as well. So what are we supposed to do? In fear of one dictatorship that may be a terrible one, we would create a slowly pacing dictatorship of our own. Uh, so this is exactly why Mises would be advocating for emergency makeshift. And if you go on Wikipedia or any mainstream page about Mises, this, this quote uh, is always there. And I suppose this is also the success of KGB propaganda department uh, and their psychological war. And his argument was a utilitarian one. And he argued that uh, the emergency makeshift uh, to save European civilization precisely against uh, Bolshevism would be some kind of fascist dictatorship, but only because of these phenomenons that were installed in society and uh, how society was trying to subvert. So it was basically fighting evil with evil. And again, as I argued, we see this now from the naturalist. I mean, I, I, I carry out my argument in the naturalist framework. This. This one is a utilitarian one, but let's assume for a while that we are utilitarians uh, and we do the makeshift. And then let's ask ourselves, can this makeshift be undone? Uh, isn't the nature of power such that if we give it like a finger, it will take a hand? And there's already an example from the very early days of the US, uh, 13 years after 1776. And in 1776, John Adams signed his name under the Jeffersonian version of uh, natural law, but it didn't take long for him to uh, revoke freedom of speech facing an undeclared war with France. So it's possible that even if we do such makeshift, uh, it can't be undone due to the nature of power. So to answer the first question, I would have to argue that it is impossible to extend the definition of aggression to information war and still become naturalist, because then we would violate natural law ourselves. It is too complicated of a process, and we would end up in a crippling dictatorship of our own. But if we look closer into this question, I would even argue that it doesn't make sense to ask that. Why? Let's look at the rules for revolution again. So if you look closely, you will see that for them to succeed, they already need an overgrown political system. So if we, so if we corrupt the young or create hostile groups, it, only, it can only result in revolution and its subversion if one group has power over another group. If we want to get discontentment and inflation, it can only work if the government is already in charge of monetary uh, policy. So being uh, prone to information war means that we are already in an overgrown political system that violates that natural law. So that's why asking this question doesn't really make sense. Uh, they already need the power structure for this subversion to cripple through. So my extended answer to question one is that 
it's practically, if we ask question one, uh, if, we are, if we can be subverted, then it means the natural law is already somehow violated. Because it means we live in a power structure where morality and values of group A can be forced upon group B. So if we, for once, if we stop being unapologetic about ethics being higher than law, we would end up in this propaganda gang wars. So what would be my answer to question three? Like what could be the best defense against subversion? Maximum decentralization and maximum self-responsibility so that uh, no group A has power over group B in a big way. And, uh, and ma maximally decentralized states so that uh, power couldn't grow because as we know it grows extensively, extensively with the size of the state. So this is the proposition of how to fight an information war, dissolve the structure and reverse the process of creating big centralized governments. And to answer the second question, was Karl Popper naive in what he wrote about the paradox intolerance I would say that in this paragraph he was in the sense that it will not be possible to have a clear demarcation line between those that seek to abolish the rule of law and subvert the society because this is done in very insidious cultural ways. And we cannot just close down theaters if we know the Soviet Union exists. And I think it's still very relevant today, especially after what I've seen. Thank you. We have three, min three minutes for questions, so I guess we can take two of them. Um, you talked about a very important issue and a very important topic, which is uh, psychological operations, basically. Um, but I would disagree on one point. Perhaps it is disingenuous to say that this phenomenon is only happening in a certain region or, or from a certain actor only. For instance, if you look at uh, the invasion of Iraq and the manufacturing of consent that led up to that, and that was important to happen for them to, be, for them to do that, it, it's also very much apparent. So when we talk about psychological operations, I think it's also important to to, to look at the domestic psychological operations as well and to see their effects because they can be just as crucial and just as detrimental to society. And on the other point, you also mentioned free speech. Um, do you think that it is also an issue if we limit uh, free speech because it, it, it certainly disintegrates the free marketplace of ideas? Do you agree with this statement and do you think it could be an issue for, for a free flow of information? Um, well, firstly, I, of course, uh, those uh, phenomena exist f also from in a, in a domestic way. In it's not only some kind of other entity, uh, so so they are always there. And uh, I only used like a very um, big example here. And uh, yes, I agree with this statement. So, like, free speech has a lot of. Uh, <coughs> consequences also on the economic side. And I would agree, argue that limiting free speech will always be dangerous. And sometimes it will take longer for us to see how, but, but yes. Thank you very much. More questions? So uh, in light of uh, Yuri Besmanov's uh, comments on uh, 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 sub subversion of the United States uh, by uh, by Russia. Uh, I, it it is uh, pretty clear that uh, it has already come uh, come quite quite far in uh, increasing increasing the time preference of the citizens and dividing dividing people into tribal groups, especially uh, the left versus the right. So I wonder if you have uh, some uh, thoughts about uh, what. Uh, what will ultimately occur? Will it uh, may it uh, end up in a civil war, or will will uh, it uh, end up with the people the people becoming more interesting uh, than in uh, secession or uh, something like that? 
Um, it's a good question. I was thinking about that. If you read, actually, if you read Basmenov, he said that uh, he would predict for communist revolution to happen in the States as early as in the 80s, but he was clearly traumatized and very pessimistic because, well, he, you know where he came from. But now I see that these processes are very, very stretched in time. So right now we see a lot of what they aimed at, like only now in 2019, and I would see that Bezmenov in his pessimism didn't see certain positive uh, mechanisms, and, uh, but it's really hard to predict. It, there could be a civil war and probably some champagne in Kremlin that would pop up. Uh, but uh, again, I think going to the first talk of this session, uh, I hope that uh, the basis of, I see a lot of, uh, the basis of American Revolution is still very present in the culture, maybe not in politics, but in the culture. Uh, and there's still the Second Amendment. So I wouldn't be very pessimistic, but I don't know. Let's see. All right, that's it. Thank you, Agnieszka.